Remaker's Mark, Episode 64, Big Trouble in Little China. Hello again, and welcome back to Remaker's Mark. Here we are in our 64th episode, part two, in fact, where we are continuing to discuss Big Trouble in Little China. With me, as always, are my friends Andy Wicks. Andy, speaking of a couple things that were mentioned in the movie... How was that for a segue? Uh, magic potion or six demon bag? Your smoothest segue yet. Thank you. Uh, I am well and always magic potion. Hmm, nice. You're such a wizard at heart. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Nielsen, how are you? And how about you? Magic potion or six demon bag? I am doing lovely and I always go with the unknown. So six demon bag. I like it. Or bag depending on what part of the country you're in. Big or bag? Big. Get a bag of bagels? That's one of the things that my brother-in-law from North Carolina consistently makes fun of my sister and my family for. Yeah. I just call it a sack. Six demon bag. (laughs) (laughs) Bag. That's really weird. The White Tiger, how are you tonight and what about you? Magic potion or six demon bag? I'm great and uh, magic potion because I don't know what the other one is. Mm. All the more exciting. But you don't necessarily know what the magic potion is either. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Fair enough. It's really just like a suicide at the movie theater, right? You know, we just look yeah. at every, every pop, you just chug it. And you assume something <laughs> magical happens. Yeah. We're going to do a lightning round after this inspired by that, Andy. So uh, just get ready for oh, that. Boy. Okay. Uh, Mark Josting, how are you? And magic potion or six demon bag? I'm well. Thank you for asking. And... I got to go six demon bag because who doesn't love surprises? I mean, you never know what you're going to get. You reach in, pull one out, see what's chomping on your hand. Maybe you hit at parties where you want to murder everyone. It's like if Quentin Tarantino directed Aladdin. Yes. (laughs) No, thank you. But yes. (laughs) Yes. All of the above. Uh, My name is Kyle. I'll be your host once again this fine evening. And I, I, yeah, I got to go six demon bag. I mean, you got to figure that. At least one of those will be incredibly interesting. You know, it could be world ending. It could be terrible. It could be kind of like Cabin in the Woodsy. Who knows? But uh, yeah, you know, from an entertainment perspective, uh, I really think you can't beat it. Now, the lightning round, inspired by Andy's question of movie theater uh, soda adventures. Let's <laughs> pretend that we are in. Him. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend we are in a movie theater that has one of those make your own Coke dispensers, you know, where you can kind of like do, you know, st- you can do strawberry Fanta, you can do, you know, or grape Coke, whatever. Okay, going quickly down the road, what are your, what is your pick when you have infinite selections in the movie theater like that? Andy, go. Vanilla strawberry. Jer, go. Mellow yellow with grape. Ooh, nice. Lee, go. Uh, cherry with 7-Up. Ooh, nice. Ooh, Mark, nice. go. Always Dreamsicle. Orange and vanilla Coke. Nice. Oh, that sounds oh, so good. Oh, we got a winner. Nice. That's a really good one. We'll usually do Grape Sprite. That's Ooh. usually because we don't want to get like crazy caffeinated and those things. Like even the small is like 197 ounces. They're gigundas. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I got to go Dreamsicle, man. That sounds... That sounds the small good. is a Toyota Prius gas tank. Yeah, pretty pretty much. (laughs) Uh, That's funny. They got a good rate on them. Uh, Jer, this was your pick. So uh, you once again get to give us a recommendation. What are you recommendationing us for us? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, My recommendation this week is inspired uh, somewhat by the fact that we are approaching and in the midst of the holiday season and family at least in my case, is spread out uh, in a very large geographic area, so we don't always get a chance to see each other every holiday. And for Thanksgiving this year, we were supposed to get together, but because of some COVID-related unfortunates, uh, we did not. Uh, But we did get to spend some time uh, enjoying each other's company with the help of an online uh, game-playing system called Jackbox Games. And I'd like to recommend... Oh, Jackbox yeah. games for those of you that want to get together, have some fun, have some laughs with each other, and play some games, but uh, you aren't in the same room with each other. They have uh, a v- pretty decent catalog of games, 
they're all going to be kind of trivia or uh, games centered around some of the classic concepts like Pictionary or Balderdash or trivia games or things like that. Punch in your answer, try to fool everybody, that sort of thing. Um, they're they're great. The graphics are silly. The whole thing is silly, and it's just a reason to hang out in a Skype room with each other and uh and yuck it up for a little while. So Jackbox Games is the is the designer, the maker, jackboxgames.com. And they have, uh, like I said, a pretty robust games catalog for your online gaming uh, social needs. Now, do, do they facilitate voice chat as well, such that uh, you would need something like Skype in addition? I am not aware of that. Um, what we what we have always done is uh, my sister, who has the account because she uses it in her classroom quite a bit, so she has a lot more things unlocked. Um, and so she will share her screen with us, and then everybody else just downloads the jack or, or goes onto their phone. They don't have to download anything. You go onto the whatever the URL is on your phone. So you're playing on your phone, and then we're using sort of the shared screen for the the main game plus our Skype video chat. Oh, okay, okay. Sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. Excellent. But, uh, to answer your question, it, there isn't an in-game chat system, but there isn't one needed to play the game, but it's helpful to have some sort of shared screen of some kind. Towards the tail end of when Apple was working from home and we were just like doing anything to get content to fill days, uh, we had a couple jackbox party game uh hours and that was really really fun i enjoyed that i think if i'm if my internet history is remembering correct uh for those of you who were internet nerds in the 90s and maybe early 2000s there was a great game called you don't know jack and i think this is sort mm -hmm. of the evolution of that i believe many, it many, sprang many other from games. the same company yeah yeah yes yep yep makes sense at least so yeah i always love that game so makes makes good sense so, yeah, if you're not going to be able to make it home for Christmas or New Year's or whatever, then give that a try. I think it's pretty good for kids, too. Like there's, you know, I think there's probably more suggestive ones. But overall, I think it's, you know, friendly for teen gatherings, if you will, or what have you. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's a filter or something that you could adjust for that. But, I mean, the one we played, which was kind of the balderdashy come up with the 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 fact and and if you fool people, you get points. And if you guess the right answer, you get points kind of idea. And some of them were a little weird and not necessarily dirty, but suggestive. Um, yeah. So, but I don't know. There might be a way to kind of turn that off too. Yeah. 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 Cool. Good pick. We will link that in the show notes, but uh, I like that a lot. Good choice. All right, so, uh, Jer, since this was your choice, I am up next, so I get to pick the next movie, which I am very excited about. I didn't know where the timing of this episode was going to land. I had an idea for this uh, that I was very excited about, and I really hope the timing worked. And it didn't quite work as perfectly as I hoped it would, uh, but I'm still pretty happy about it. Uh, the movie that I am picking to watch next is the 1984 David Lynch film, Dune. <laughs> this will oh, tie no. in. Wow! This will tie, <laughs> we have to watch tie in that nicely one? to uh, <laughs> to Hodorowski's Dune, the documentary. Uh, what was it? Oh, What's Up Doc that we did. So you know, this was mentioned there. Uh, and then recently they had the Denis Villeneuve uh, Dune. So I'm hoping we can find a way to watch that if we hadn't. So we can kind of do a maybe like a third episode review of it because it is something else. Uh, if not, no worries. But I thought that would be really fun. So uh, this movie is a trip. It is. Uh, Isn't it like nine hours long? No, it's not too bad. It's like 230 or something. Okay. It's not ridiculous. Okay. It does have my my favorite title card of any movie ever which is in giant, like almost kind of like kind of beveled Roman font songs by Toto. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to get you excited as if, you know, you didn't need to be already with David Lynch and everything, but uh, yeah, Toto does some of the music and 
it's it's pretty great. And by trip, you mean turd, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we'll we'll get into it. I I enjoy this movie probably more than I should. <laughs> I it's have an a enjoyable feeling I'm movie. Not going to. <laughs> <laughs> if if you're able to enjoy it, that's my John Maddenism of the day. Maybe a little hair <laughs> in there. I don't know. But is this the first movie that we have done on this podcast that actually has already had a remake? Oh, I can't. Maybe? No, I, no, no, no. I don't think so. I don't know. That's a good question. We'll have to look into that. Because when we did the Ghostbusters episode, the new Ghostbusters hadn't been done. And that wasn't really a remake. Yeah, the uh, Witchmadinger, Rebel Wilson and Anne Hathaway, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels remake right. didn't happen yet. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. A, th- so. a thought to consider. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm super excited. I think it'll be really fun. Uh, I just love David Lynch. Uh, I love what he brings to cinema. This is not one of his favorite films, and I don't think it is the favorite of many of his fans, but whatever. I'm still down. It's got big warmth. Hasn't, hasn't he say? tried to like actively have his name removed from it? No, not really. <laughs> he just doesn't really talk about it. Like it's not... He doesn't love it, but he's he's not really the kind of like, you know, deny my history kind of guy. <laughs> he's too weird for that. I think uh, Hodorowski enjoyed it. It's it's not as bad as Damon Lindelof offering his fans to come and punch him or yell at him at cons for Pr- Prometheus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I enjoyed that movie. Ah, oh, boy. All right. So uh, that is my pick. I'm excited about that. We will be getting into that very shortly here. Now, let us focus our attention again on Big Trouble in Little China. Before we get into our discussion of the film, let's do a recap of the recasting here for the major characters. They were kind of all major characters. We had one that was more major than the others, but the first five were, you know, major-ish characters. For the role of Eddie, originally played by Donald Lee, we went with Jer's choice of Randall Park. Yay. Good job. For the role of Egg Shen, originally played by Victor Wong. We went with Mark's choice of Chow Yun Fat, which I just I can't wait for the makeup on that alone. Uh, for the role of Gracie Law, originally played by Kim Cattrall, we went with Lee's choice of Samara Weaving. I love that. I'm Yay. Really her. She's awesome. For, for the role of Wang Chi, originally played by Dennis Dunn, we went with Andy's choice of John Cho. I like that. Yay. I like that. For the role of Lo Pan, originally played by James Hong, we went with Mark's inspired choice of Lucy Liu. I think yeah. that is so cool. <laughs> I was so excited for that. Uh, and then finally, the the big one of all of them, Jack Burton, originally played by Kurt Russell. Uh, in a tiebreaker, we went with Andy's choice of Dax Shepard, which I think is yeah. really, really good. I'm I'm really excited for that. I think that's a great pick. Well done. Jer, it sounds like you have some social media feedback. I have a little bit, yes. Uh, I knew that my friend group would be interested in this episode um i wasn't completely prepared for the backlash of how dare yous and leave jack burton alone but i did get a lot of that uh but after egging some people on i did get some responses and they are thus uh jonathan lee's first his first response was the cast of community And then he said, (laughs) I'm going to think about this more and give you a real answer tomorrow. And his real answer the next day uh, is high concept, gritty reboot directed by Guillermo del Toro with Joaquin Phoenix as Jack Burton. Whoa, (laughs) that's interesting. That is high concept. Yep. I I don't know if I love it, but I'm intrigued. I prefer the cast of Community. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Then we've got Brent Godowski said Don Cheadle. Which is interesting. I like yeah. Don Cheadle. We don't talk about him very much on this. That's podcast. true. We should. We need to cast him more. Uh, let's see. There was a leave it alone. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, and tread carefully. <laughs> and finally, Heather Wirtz said, and I think that she was just listing off people that would play Jack Burton and not a full cast here. But she said, uh, Jason Sudeikis, Joel McHale, Chris O'Dowd, or Bill Hader. Interesting. Wow. A lot of different energies there. I I actually really like Bill Hader. I think that'd be pretty cool. I like pretty much that full list. And that that those are all very interesting and yes, very different. I kinda want to see a a British big trouble in Little China. That would be that would be pretty interesting. You can combine it with uh Arrested Development and have it Big Trouble (laughs) in Little Britain. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. Well, thank you to all who provided audience feedback. That's awesome. 
So let us now dig into, in part two here, what we liked about the movie, what we didn't like about the movie, what we would change, uh, some performances, all that kind of fun stuff. Where we are starting here is what I think is the overarching thing of the movie, which is just kind of the vibe of this movie. It is just so interesting, so unique. We've talked about how there's a lot of things in the melting pot that is this movie. Jared, you want to kind of touch on what that felt like for you? Man, I could talk about this and have talked about this movie for a very long time. So if I just need to shut up, just tell me to shut up, I guess. But I love how this movie feels. It feels like that early 80s, just barely on the rails kind of kind of movie. Uh, you've got John Carpenter, who's who's putting together that kind of movie pretty consistently at this point and working in in these constraints of budget and time and everything else. So he's throwing out every, every little director camera trick and every practical effect he can to, to great success, I think. And it's, it's a story that barely makes sense. And it's a cast that shouldn't quite work. And it's uh, all of it just feels like it, it's barely being held together. And somehow through, magic and and love it does and i just uh i i just there you don't see movies like this anymore because studios aren't gonna green light this project anymore unless there's a a plus blockbuster hero involved and then if it's you know then if they're involved they're gonna say well i need to be able to do this 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 and this they're not gonna look dopey like jack burton does and so like all of it just really got pulled together in a way that was so unique to the time and place, but it doesn't feel like a time and place kind of movie. It feels, it feels sort of timeless. Uh, Mark, how about you? You got some, you got some thoughts. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'd, I'd agree that it does have kind of like a timeless feel that the, the modern culture in, in this movie could be contemporary modern culture and it wouldn't change the story a lot uh, if at all. And one of the things that interested me was uh, where this movie sits, like uh, in the you know development of of uh, genres in film. I I meant to do some actual research on this, but did not. But so I I'd like to see uh, uh, what you guys think about how wrong I might be. But uh, uh, it like it seems to me like bef- uh, before the mid '80s, there was very little of uh, fantasy in in modern culture sort of sort of movies and i think there have been a lot since then but uh if there is if there's anything fantasy before mid 80s it was probably like high fantasy and just straight up fantasy but uh this is a this is a really good i don't know where, what the word i'm looking for is but uh the juxtaposition of that sort of ancient lore magic mysticism in the modern culture uh, i think this one does it really well and i don't know if there are are any other American movies that's that try to dabble in in Asian lore? What do you guys think? Like, is is this kind of on the on the forefront of a wave of of genre films? I think the genre that you were looking for maybe would be called contemporary fantasy. I don't know. To answer your last point, though, uh, interesting fact about this movie is that it was uh, in a race to get released with Golden Child. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the studios panicked about getting it out in time because if they were worried that if it came out after Golden Child, it would just be, oh, this is just trying to be Golden Child, and it would flop. And so they they condensed everything down to make sure that it got released several months before the Golden Child. But, but beyond those two, I don't know that there's a lot of, uh, of sort of this same kind of movie. I, I think there are some, and I think that mid eighties tried to dabble in a lot of this sort of sci-fi slash fantasy, but in a contemporary setting kind of idea. But, but I think you're right. I think that this was sort of a, this was, this was Hollywood trying something new. Yeah. I think like Disney did fantastical things like, you know, the chitty chitty bang bangs and Pete's dragon. Like there've, there've been movies that had fantastical elements, but not like, fantasy per se you know what i mean i think there was some live action animation kind of mixes that were interesting in that way but i uh, i wouldn't call them fantasy by any means you know but before the 80s but yeah yeah things like bed knobs and broomsticks and things like that there's magic elements in it yep 
Mary Poppins. Mm, yeah, yeah. I don't know if anyone's ever called that a fantasy film. <laughs> but yeah, magical for sure. <laughs> Kids. <laughs> yes, <laughs> magical. Yeah, maybe that's a good way to put it. So magical instead of fantasy. Yeah. And then I think before this, you had things like Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. And um, even Willow came out pretty close to this. So you had sort of like you were saying, the sort of high fantasy swords swords and magic kind of epics yeah and like the uh the ralph bakshi lord of the rings uh animated films were right somewhere yep. in a few years before this yeah they were they've been trying to make that a working genre forever but this is this is something outside of that i think i think there's one that we're not remembering here and i'm a little ashamed of lee for not remembering this especially but i think we're ignoring hercules in new york uh, I feel like that is a, you know, that is right, right in that the crosshairs of fantasy and, uh, and modern day. So, uh, you know, I don't know how we did that, but here we are. Well, and also the last dragon. <laughs> also the last yeah. dragon. Yes. Yeah. What, what year was last dragon? I don't remember. 85. 85. Okay. So real close. Yeah. <laughs> oh, funny. I couldn't resist. I could barely get that out. <laughs> <laughs> Hercules, where Arnold Schwarzenegger is uh, completely dubbed throughout the whole movie because <laughs> yes. nobody could understand what he was saying. Yep. Yep. Good old Arnie. Yep. And overdubbed by a guy from the 1940s. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Listen here, see? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Hercules. <laughs> Uh, I really enjoyed kind of talking about the vibe of the movie. I really like the way that they started it out with the interview with Egg Shen. Um, I thought that was really cool. Like they did a good job of, of establishing the stakes. They did a good job of uh, basically establishing characters. Like they already made Jack Burton kind of like a mythic character before you even see him and get a chance to judge him as his, you know, dorky terribleness. But it was so great, and it establishes magic as a reality in this current world. I just thought that was so cool. It could have been so cheesy, and I think at its heart it probably was kind of cheesy, but I just loved it so much. I just thought that was such a brilliant way to start the movie. I just adored it. If I remember right, that was an, a late add-on that the studio requested. Cool. Because they didn't, they wanted something or another. But it was another way that John Carpenter really sort of got what he wanted while also giving the studio what they wanted. Like they, yes, make, make Jack Burton feel like the hero, make him even more of a mythical presence while in the movie, he's really not at all. Yeah. <laughs> and it just is another, it's another way that he, he, he subverted the the expectations of everybody and just like pulled the wool over the eyes of the studio. I love that. I think it, it yeah. might've been nice if we came back to the, to the, the detectives but um i mean i don't know if the movie really needed that but uh it'd be kind of nice to button that up yeah i think it could have but i don't feel like it's lacking because of it i think if like i think it's a very forgettable opening other than the fact that it's perfect i guess <laughs> you know what i mean like it it does its job perfectly and then just completely forgets about it which i think is fine i'm not too terribly worried about it but you know could have been an interesting loop back maybe they were setting up a sequel i don't know I can't believe there hasn't been a sequel to this. Now that I say that out loud, that's really weird. Anthony Birch, who many of you would know as the dungeon master to the podcast Dungeons and Daddies, co-wrote a graphic novel series called Old Man Jack. Mm -hmm. That is about is essentially a sequel to this. No way. Yep. That's cool. I had no idea. <laughs> it's a hundred percent cool. It's an awesome, awesome story too. I've paged through it a little bit. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but it's it's like. It's it's him uh, living in Florida, basically retired and having to, quote unquote, come out of retirement to save the world. That's so good. Anthony Birch is amazing. He's he's so good yeah. at what he does. Yeah, man, he's fantastic, yeah. incredible. I'll have to check that out. Let's link that in the show notes so we can uh, maybe get a get a library request for that or something. That'd be good. Uh, Mark, you also mentioned something in particular from this movie that had like a huge impact on your childhood brain. What was that? Yeah. Um, speaking of awesome and amazing, uh, could we talk about the three storms, thunder, lightning and rain, uh, the kind of henchmen of Lopan? I, I guess I'd like your opinions on this because uh, I saw this movie as a kid and as a kid, it was probably easier to impress me. But uh, I think those characters are so awesome. They, you know, they all have their different superpowers and, you know, they they make a great team together. 
they're so imposing. Yeah, they, they walk out into a battlefield and, and just own it. Fantastic. So those of you who didn't see this until adulthood, how wrong am I? <laughs> I don't I don't think you're wrong. Yeah, uh, I loved them. I was totally obsessed with them. What I think is so cool is that the first time you see them and they come out in that in that fight, they don't really do anything super spectacular besides the one guy riding down on a lightning bolt. But <laughs> all they do is just sort of stand there and pull out their weird weapons. And the way that you know that they're badass is because everyone's terrified of them from both sides and they mm -hmm. don't even have to do anything. And then later the, we get to see them kind of in their full, full powers and stuff. And then it's like, okay, these are the, these are the main bad guy. This is the, these are the mini bosses. Yeah. I could see that being a hundred percent lifted from a Kung Fu movie, you know, like a Japanese Kung Fu movie or whatever. And just set right there and it's fine. You know what I mean? Like it's, it just fits perfectly with, the vibe of the movie and those characters. So yeah, I, I could see that being like a glorious ripoff, uh, if you will, of, of other better Kung Fu movies. Yeah. Kung Fu is Chinese, by the way. Thank you. Sorry. Appreciate it. That's a nice segue actually into Jerry. Jerry, you mentioned that it's, uh, it's kind of nice to not feel bad about liking a movie from the eighties. That that's a refreshing change. So say more about that. Yeah. We've, <laughs> we've done quite a few movies, uh, on this podcast that are, 70s 80s uh centric movies and oftentimes the conversation topic comes up of either how women are presented in the movie or how minorities and and uh other groups are presented in movies the 80s didn't do a good job at any of those for the <laughs> most part i thought that uh, upon rewatching this i thought that this movie does a reasonably good job at portraying a culture other than Caucasian and the characters within that in a pretty reasonable and uh, honoring way. I could be wrong and I would be, I would welcome being told I'm wrong so that I could understand better. But I felt like that this movie was that John Carpenter really wanted to focus on the characters that weren't the white people. And if if uh, Gracie Law and Jack Burton were there, they were going to be sort of the dopey sidekicks and everybody else was going to get the center stage. That's just kind of how I how 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 it appeared to me. I don't know. What do you guys uh, do you guys agree, disagree? I'm perfectly willing to be told that I'm off base on this. Uh, I totally agree. I think um, I think this film is just is mostly set in that Chinese culture. And Jack especially is the fish out of water. Gracie feels a little bit more natural because she seems to actually know things about that culture. But uh, yeah, it, it seems really more like observational about about little China and the uh, and the Chinese mysticism. I, I don't think it tries to put anything on uh, onto it. It tells us what's there, and, uh, and it, yeah, and doesn't get judgy or anything. Yeah, it wasn't ever a punchline. Uh, none of the characters were ever really a punchline. Uh, it, it just, yeah, it felt like it inhabited a world that exists. Yeah, we're going to get into that in the next part here where we're discussing, discussing Jack specifically. But I remember in part one, someone mentioned that there are so many opportunities for winks in this movie of like, haha, self-referential. But it never does that. And I think if yeah. they did that with the mystical pieces, it would have felt significantly less authentic, less genuine, and therefore less exciting and less interesting. So I'm so glad that they didn't do that at all. It just was true. Like they, again, that that starting of the movie just set it up as though this was the most normal thing in the world, that this gentleman is being interviewed talking about green, like, what was it, green flames or a green bubble or whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, he does lightning bolts between his hands. Like, it just felt like, oh, okay, I guess it's Thursday. It's lightning bolt between the hands day. You know, I mean, it's just it just <laughs> felt like the the most normal thing other than the fact that it was completely extraordinary which i thought was awesome pretty refreshing 180 from the last dragon huh yeah for sure yes <laughs> you're here so let's move on to talk about jack right so he's the he's the goofy elephant in the room jer you had a, a long point on this surprise surprise uh, why don't you get us started on the discussion of Jack and what he means to you, what he means to the movie, how you felt it was, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the reasons why I love this movie that I didn't realize watching it as a kid 
but looking back on it now is actually a reason why I loved it is that Jack is just, uh, he, he's a bad at his job. I mean, well, <laughs> uh, he's, he doesn't, he thinks he's the hero of this movie. And in reality, he is not, he thinks that this story is his story and it is not. And there are so many different ways that that could be played in a movie. And I think the way that John Carpenter and, um, Kurt Russell, the guy, the Kurt Russell, <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> the way that, the way that Kurt Russell played it is so perfect because he's, you know, he's bringing in this bizarre John Wayne impression and he's just super like everything about him is super macho, almost over the top, but not quite. And it's all very like, I got things under control. Everybody, nobody has to panic because I'm here. But he has no idea what he's doing. And that is shown not just from like the movie showing us yeah, that, yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know that there's a safety on a gun. He shoots the thing and the stuff falls on his head and he, you know, knocks himself unconscious. Like it, it shows him failing, but it also every other scene is him like, Hey, don't worry. I got it under control. Well, somebody please tell me what's happening. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> like he just, he, 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 most of his dialogue is saying, huh? What? And I just, I love that, that, that hero was so anti anti eighties for action movies. And even now, like you, you have movies like the fast and furious franchise and some of these other ones where you hear stories about like the rock or Vin Diesel or these guys writing into their contract that they can't bleed or they have to punch the bad guy more times than they get punched or all of this just ridiculous stuff that it's like that would ruin this movie. And Jack Burton is just such an interesting, dumb, dumb character. And I love him so much because of the performance that, that, uh, Kurt Russell decided to to do with it, and it's just it's hilarious without being winky. It's swaggery without being, you know, too over the top, and it's just it's dumb without being silly. I love the fact that partway through the movie, you know, like eventually he and Gracie, you know, make out because you know they're going to. It's an it's an intense time and place, and you know emotions are running high, and. For the for the rest of the movie, he's got like lipstick just smeared all over his face, <laughs> which I think is perfect. Like he doesn't know it, the the audience knows it, and it is made so much better because of that. Like it's it's not that lipstick is inherently emasculating, but I think it meant to do that in a way that was absolutely spot on, perfect. You know what I mean? It just drove home everything that came before it in terms of him you know, being kind of bumbling, not really knowing what's going on, just like, and, and owning every second of that. I just love that moment so much. It made me so happy. It was very, it's very humanizing. Yeah. 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 Totally. When we were talking about the recasting of it, we talked about, you know, what, what, what exactly is this performance? And I think we essentially landed on the fact that Jack Burton is completely lifting John Wayne uh, which we have talked about John Wayne movies here. Uh, you know, he is an iconic character, uh, an iconic actor. You know, I mean, he he is masculinity for so many people who grew up watching Westerns. Uh, I am not that person. And I sort of have, as a result of the larger world around us, quite a averse reaction to masculinity in a lot of ways. So I wanted to hate this character so much just because it was impersonating, ripping off, lifting, whatever, uh, John Wayne. But in spite of all of that, I couldn't hate the character. You know what I mean? Like it's, I, it had everything stacked against it in terms of what the character could have been like, like the terrible monologue in the truck. That was also awesome. And just all, <laughs> you know, just like everything, it should have been awful. And I should have hated this character, but I never could. Uh, I put he's such a brilliant dumbass, which I think is the perfect, <laughs> perfect encapsulation of Jack Burton. He's a brilliant dumbass. Yes. Well, and I think another thing with the, with the John Wayne is that when when this script first was getting passed around, and I think even when John Carpenter first got it, this was supposed to take place in the Old West. Oh, like the huh. early days of San Francisco and the Gold Rush and that that time period, and so it was essentially a western, and it was. A, apparently awful and un 
unmakeable. But they, through <laughs> all of this, you know, script revising processes and things, they got to, to what it is now. But I think that in a, in a way, they wanted to keep some of that sort of Western vibe, kind of similar to how uh, sort of the show Firefly is a Western in space, and yeah. this is sort of a Western in in, in this uh, sort of cosmological, you know, uh, the <laughs> mystic, mysticism sort of way. Uh, cosmological is not the right word, if it is even a word. Um, it is even a word. to the point that that Jack Burton. Instead of a cowboy hat, he's always got the trucker hat that he's kind of, you know, putting on like a cowboy hat. He walks out at the end of the movie with saddlebags for some reason <laughs> that don't make any sense at all. <laughs> they tried to make this Western sensibility to it. And I think that's one of, and, and the the John Wayne impression just works because of that. Or, and you don't even realize it. We touched on this a little bit in part one, but I, Jerry, if you want to kind of bring home the idea that... <laughs> Jack Burton is 100% supposed to be the hero of this movie and 100% does not end up being so. And uh, you called it a two-sided coin trick, which I love. So tell us a little bit more about that. In order to get this movie made, the producer, the director, they had to convince whoever the studio was. I don't remember. Um, but they had to convince them that they have a big name and it's going to be an action movie with an action star. But that's not the movie that that's not the script that they had. And that's not the movie that John Carpenter wanted to make. He wanted to make a movie that, that we saw with the, with Asian culture being at the forefront and this uh, Asian mysticism and, and, and the heroes within all of that. And so he had to sort of create this balancing act of making a movie that could be shown to producers and, and studios to say, look, isn't Jack Burton awesome? Doesn't he kick so much ass and he's, just such a great hero, but then also just undermine him at every possible time, moment to <laughs> continue to shine the light where it was supposed to be shined, shown. Uh, and he he pulls it off really, really well. And, and unfortunately, I think a side effect of that is when this movie came out, nobody liked it. <laughs> it didn't do it didn't do all that well until the 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 VHS period of time and then it was kind of one of those vhs darlings that have, has has risen into kind of cult status since then but um yeah I, I i think that it's a really interesting unique movie because of because of that aspect of it plus it made it that much more interesting character the the main character you know and it they, they kind of they kind of let the cat out of the bag early on in the movie in terms of who they are going to visit or who they're trying to get from the airport. And then it just essentially becomes Wang Chi's movie, which is awesome because he kicks yeah. total ass. Like he's an interesting character. Like he's developed, you know, it's, it's not, you know, he's an action lacking. hero. Yes. Yep. He, he's an eighties action hero. He, he does martial arts. He, he beats everybody that gets in, you know, that he faces, he fought the, you know, the main storm at the end. Like, this is his this is his movie, but nobody realized it. <laughs> Andy and Lee, do you guys have anything to say? You've been uh, kind of back backstaged by my jabbering. <laughs> uh, I don't really have anything to add at this point. Uh, I have chosen to keep my mouth shut because I have mostly disagreed with just about everything you guys have said. <laughs> I love it. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> Lee and I will have a spinoff episode of this one. This wasn't for me. <laughs> so bef before we get into other performances, then let's let's touch on that. Andy, where, where where is the source of your umbrage? It's not even umbrage. It's just I, I didn't think this movie was that good. I apparently had never seen it in its entirety until now. And I don't know. It, this, this hit me similarly to Romancing the Stone in that I didn't like that one at all either. And. I don't know. I mean, I I don't want to I don't want to just go off on a Dennis Miller rant here. So suffice it to say, I please thought, do please oh. do. <laughs> well, okay then. Um, Those liberals in the media, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the the character of Jack Burton was completely unnecessary, uh, and I it, I actually kind of cringed and despised every time he was on the screen. I didn't find him endearing. I didn't find him. I, I did find him completely bumbling and ineffective. Uh, I agreed with those perspectives, but I just thought he was in the way and confusing. 
uh, I didn't think that his performance as the kind of the, the, I can't forget your term, Kyle, um, something about something dumbass, but, uh, brilliant dumbass, the brilliant dumbass. I didn't find it. I just found him as a dumbass. And I don't know if that's, uh, Kurt Russell's fault or John Carpenter's fault or what I like. I just, it felt very wooden and forced and I didn't like that. And yeah, I don't know. I did. I did. Uh, the special effects to me were super hokey. I thought that when this was movie was made at a time when I f- thought that the effects could have been better. So it made me wonder like, was this a super low budget film and they were trying to do things with, uh, yeah, I just, this movie just really just kind of missed the mark with me. I feel like I would have maybe responded to this better if I had seen it as a kid. Yeah, I, w- I agree with that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, seeing it as an adult, it just didn't, I just didn't respond to it. So, yeah. yeah. I feel like there's a lot of movies, similar genre movies from a similar time that were just a lot better. Agreed. A good friend of mine that I thought was going to jump at the chance to talk about this movie, uh, whose name is Joe, said almost verbatim what you said. He's like, I didn't care for it. And everybody's like, how could you say that? What are you talking about? And he's like, I didn't see it until like five years ago. I didn't care for it. <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling there's a, there's a lot of movies like that that yeah. I love because I saw them as kids and I know that, you know, people that see them as adults are like, meh. I feel like if I hadn't seen The Golden Child when I was a kid and I saw it now, I don't think I would like it. But It just so happens that I have a lot of nostalgic connection to that movie. So, and it's similar to this one. That's a great comparison. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm so curious about uh, how much my reaction to, to this movie and the golden child as well, you know, are, are because I saw them when I was young. I, yeah, I'd really love to know what the, uh, what my reaction would be if, if I was just coming to these fresh and blank when I know for sure that I'm the kind of person that would appreciate a movie like this. And I, I want to be clear. There are elements of this film that I really, really enjoyed. If you, if this movie was strictly about Chinatown and the goings on within it, I probably would have liked it more if any of the, the white characters were taken out of it. If all of them were taken out of it, and this was simply a movie about the, the criminal and mystical and magical underworld of Chinatown, I probably would have liked it more to me. It just seemed like the, the, the white characters were just kind of superfluous and in the way. And I, and I hear what you're saying, Jerry, about John Carpenter kind of pulling this trick to get the movie made. And that certainly, I don't know if that, I don't know the history of that movie, but it makes sense kind of given the time that to, to, to showcase this story, he had to kind of whitewash it for lack of a better term. And if that's true, then good on you, John Carpenter for, pulling that fast one because it did give us this movie that obviously a lot of people have enjoyed. Uh, for me, I just, I wish it would have been different and maybe in that time and in the, in that movie in the Hollywood of that day, that probably would not have been possible. I would like to know if we took Jack out of this film, well, where, do, where do we think the comedy is going to come from? Uh, well, personally, I didn't think he provided any comedy, so I wouldn't, <laughs> it would, it wouldn't be missing for me. Uh, I think it could come from better writing. I think that uh, you can still have the a buffoonish character. I mean, I, I think we talked about this before. Think of like a Shanghai Nights or Shanghai Noon or um, or the uh, da, 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 uh, Rush Hour films that you have that kind of buddy comedy with Jackie Chan where you're Owen Wilson's or your I'm forgetting that other actor's name. Chris Tucker. Thank you, Chris Tucker that they're a little buffoonish in what they do. um, But they're definitely there for the comedy. And then you let the martial arts stars do the martial arts stuff. Like that formula worked really, really well. Now, granted you also had Jackie Chan, but I feel like something similar could be done in this story. But to me, the, the Jack Burton that we had in the movie to me, it was just kind of, he just kind of had the, the, he was as interesting to me as the potato that Jer was eating when we started this call. <laughs> I think the comedy would lie. One of my favorite scenes is when Wang Shi is fighting the, is it the storm or is it, I don't know, the guy that eventually blows up. Is he a storm or is he just a, 
a goon. He's a sidekick. He is. Right? A, he is a storm. He he's is a storm. He's a storm. Okay. He's thunder. Got it. Okay. So when he's fighting thunder. And they're like, the camera is essentially facing straight forward into a room. And then Wang Chi flies over and then the storm flies over. And then you just see like a bunch of furniture go flying the other way. Like, I think they could have done a lot with that. That scene is just absolutely perfect to me. I laugh my ass off in that scene. It's so That funny. scene is 100% like silent movie. Yes, absolutely. Or Scooby-Doo. Absolutely. Yep. Or Scooby Doo, <laughs> or Scooby Doo, yeah. and then his explosion—the explosion of thunder. Oh my god, so good! Just the, <laughs> the like smoke coming out of the nose. It was essentially a cartoon. It was a hundred percent a cartoon. Yeah, that's spot on. So I could see it being more of that, more uh, slapstick, more uh, you know kung fu at heart, but funny in its execution. So I think we landed on the fact that if you saw it as a kid, you loved it. <laughs> if you didn't see it as a kid, eh, ups and downsies. That's that's fair. I think that's perfectly fair. <laughs> Uh, I want to take just a couple minutes to talk through uh, the special effects on this. Mark, why don't you talk about the visual effects first, and then I want to talk about the uh, Kung Fu a little bit as well. Yeah, um, well, I'm I'm going to land on the opposite side of Andy, where I thought the, the effects in this one were pretty good. For an era of film where there was a bunch of new effects that were still getting the, you know, the wrinkles ironed out, I think, I think this one pulled it off well. Uh, we have the, the good stuff of of Lopan uh, gliding along the floor and, and, you know, that one's pretty easy practical effect, but then, you know, he happens to float through walls and stuff. And sometimes when we, uh, when we get effects like that in, in this era of film, you can, you can really tell that the, the quality of one layer of film is not the same as the, as in the other layer of film. I, I actually think Ghostbusters suffers from that. And I don't think this one did. So I was pretty impressed. Interesting note. The same company did both. And also Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters was a year before. Movie. Or yep. two years before? Nice. I believe that the whatever the special effects company that did Ghostbusters was created to make Ghostbusters. I could be wrong. Oh, yeah. No, that's right. I watched the, um, oh, gosh, what's that series? Movies that you love. Gosh, what is it on Netflix? I can't think of the name of it. But yes, that's exactly right. One of the heads of ILM eh, left and started their own company and basically handled all the effects on it. Yes, that is exactly right. Mm. Yep, that's right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Kung Fu. Uh, it was pretty it was pretty awesome. I think the stunt work was pretty great, especially with the storms. I just thought that was great. Yeah. I mean, whoever they hired to do the choreography and everything was solid. You know, I think there were a couple of moments where uh, background actors in some of the fights were, were just sort of like, sort of just slapping each other's hands a little bit. <laughs> but other than that, I thought uh, all in all, it was really, really good. I, I enjoyed that a lot. I'd like to tack on to the to the fighting aspect of this uh, with a slightly different point. Um, do we think this movie needs a boss fight? Because I mean, we have the we have the three storms. There's a lot of great fighting with them. It's fantastic. Uh, Lopan doesn't do anything. Yeah, could this could this movie benefit if uh, you know now that we have the you know the technology to do this? If we can make uh, Lopan a more I don't know imposing and dangerous character, I I have a suggestion. Perhaps a boss fight would be appropriate, but I would also suggest that they tighten up the the story in terms of the villains, because like you said, Mark, you had Lopan who was just kind of creepy. <clears throat> then you had the storms, which were, con I was confused by the storms at first because while I liked their straw hats, I thought those were cool. <laughs> they made a lot of moves and a lot of like showy stuff, but they didn't always do a lot. And then they were like kidnapping people, I guess. And then there was that weird Chewbacca guy that I don't Beast understand man. why, <laughs> like, or Beast Man, like, I don't understand why he was there. Like, yeah, I, I truly too. don't know why he like all of a sudden, whoa, there's beast man. And then, yeah. And then there was the weird, the, uh, beholder thing, mm -hmm. but <laughs> all these like things that keep getting added on. And I was, I really was confused about who I needed to be paying attention to. And it made, for, it just made the story. The, the, the plot to me was, 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 was lost. So that would be one suggestion that I would make would be to tighten that up and then perhaps a, a better boss fight. 
This movie really does, in a lot of ways, feel like it follows a video game structure where they're going down different levels, like literally down this elevator to like the next level down till they get to the, to the, the sort of mini boss fight where they're fighting the three storms and whether it's the fault of John Carpenter's attempt to keep Jack Burton from being the heroic hero, or if it was just, if it made more sense in uh, some other narrative way, but the only real boss fight with Lopan was when Egg Shen and him played their little video game, um, <laughs> video game combat, which was interesting and cool, but also took less than a minute and then it was over and nothing really happened because of it. And then Lopan just, you know, left. Uh, that was, eh, you could never beat me. And then he left. And to the point, Mark, that you're making, I think one of the problems in the original movie with why there wasn't a boss fight is because in order to make James Hong look seven feet tall, he was on really, really tall lifts and could yeah. barely walk. Yeah. So making him do any th- sort of physical combat was pretty much impossible. Um, but that I think that in a remake, that would make a lot more sense to have him do something besides... Uh, you know, video game fighting or whatever that was. <laughs> I think we're really missing what is actually needed, which is in the fight, the video game fight that you mentioned, we just have to make it so that Lopan doesn't use his pinkies as the source of his power. Because really, that's that's no good. Like, pink, everybody knows that pinky <laughs> is the weakest digit. Like, the fact that he just kind of puts his pinkies together and then has, like, a 10-foot wide lightsaber, like, it's just, it's not realistic. I'm sorry. It's just not realistic. That's how I mime, I'm going to go play video games, is I put put my pinkies (laughs) together and move my thumbs. It's so dumb. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Lordy. So dumb. I love it. But James Hong's the best. James James Hong is the best. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. All right. So let's wrap it up here with our rating of the film. Again, this is a 1 to 10 scale. One being the worst movie you've ever seen, 10 being the best movie you've ever seen, uh, and a scale of your choosing. So, uh, Jer, since this is your pick, why don't you start us off? So I will admit that this is not a flawless movie, and uh, much of my rating is buoyed by by the nostalgia that goes along with it. So that being said, I still, even watching it a couple weeks ago uh, to refresh for this uh, podcast, and I have seen it in my adult life before it it wasn't like I hadn't seen it in 20 years, but every time I watch it, I still enjoy it. So I'm going to give this one, uh, I'm going to give this one 8.3 six demon bags. <laughs> nice. That is, that is way too many six demon bags for any one person to have, but there was a pretty big group of them. Alas, what can you do? Uh, Lee onto you. What is your rating and scale? Yeah, well, like I said, this wasn't really for me. Um, so I'll give it four green eyes. Mm, creepy. Uh, Andy, on to you. What about you, rating and scale for you? Uh, I'm right there with Lee. I'm also going to give this one four beast men. Mm, nice. Andy, I very much did enjoy your introduction to Gracie Law. One, because of the olden times uh, mentioned, which just <laughs> killed me. And then Thank you me. ended it with, what was it? Uh, and then she gets grabbed by beast man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, boom. Just straight up. I love yeah. it. So good. Uh, I'll go next. I'm going to give, so I, I love this movie. It is not a good movie. It's not a great movie. I love this movie. It's so much fun. I still enjoy it. And yes, there's absolutely childhood weight in that. Uh, I will give it 7.1 steaming noses. Because that the blowing up guy is just my that, that was like the thing that I remembered most from this movie is of his, his like growing and I love that effect that effect was top notch so good <laughs> so good all right Mark wrap us up here all right um uh, this movie is totally for me and uh, and yes there's some nostalgia value as well although I have come back to it in my adult life and uh, didn't find it as uh as flawed as as some as other people have um i think it has original characters i think it has original writing and it's uh it's it's imperfections don't make it suffer that much in my opinion uh 
Um, I'm I'm going to give it nine point seven. Not beholder beholders. Whoa, that's big. Bang. Yes. Yes. <laughs> nice. Canceling out me and Lee. That's awesome. That's good. <laughs> Man, this was fun. Jer, good pick. Thank you for making this choice. Uh, I was very happy to revisit it, and this was a fun discussion. Nice work. Yeah, I, I'm surprised by the the reactions, but I appreciate them. And uh, th- this was this was great. And I'm I am actually very happy that Andy and Lee felt comfortable uh, expressing their counterpoints yeah <laughs> they're not wrong we've done the, we, they're just we've wrong. done this long enough they're, yeah they're, they're, you're, you're not <laughs> wrong per se <laughs> uh, but yeah and, I'm not, and i've never actually seen david lynch's dune so i'm looking forward to that as well yeah how many i, I think am i the only no jerry you've seen it right i uh, i have seen so i was going to bring this up about big trouble in Little china too but i think dune totally fits into this category as well big trouble in little china i saw so much Number one, because of that VHS cache that my stepdad gave us, but also it felt like this was like on that TBS or TNT, like where they're just showing movies constantly. And so <laughs> you're just watching sort of the TNT uh, edited version of it and the, uh, the the steam coming out of the nose and hit and Jack Burton wheeling backwards down the hallway in the wheelchair were sort of the bumpers into and out of the commercials. So I remember seeing those two scenes a billion times. <laughs> uh, and Dune, similarly, was also one of those movies that was seem- seemingly always on USA or TNT or something. And so I feel like I've seen chunks of it, but I don't think I've ever seen it from beginning to end. Got it. Andy, have you seen Dune? Uh, no, I just said that I had Thank not. you. That's what I thought I would. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for paying attention. <laughs> what? Uh, Lee, have you seen Dune? <sighs> No, and uh, <laughs> I've I've avoided it on purpose. <laughs> I'm so excited <laughs> for this. Mark, Mark, have you seen Dune? I have seen parts of it, and I think it might be a similar situation to Jair, where um, it's been around, and I caught it for a little bit, but then maybe I got, I got called upstairs to eat dinner. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> got it. Okay. Also, I think there are probably parts of Dune that, are in my head as parts of Dune, but are actually part of the movie Ice Pirates, <laughs> which is very, very different. Yes. And one that I've desperately wanted to add to this podcast, but I'm going to hold off onto it for a while now because I don't uh, want to subject you guys to that. That's so awesome, man. Well, I'm excited for that. Uh, I can't wait. Remakers Mark is a proud member of the Math is Hard Network. To find out more information about this podcast or any other podcast on the network, check us out at mathishard.net. There you will find show notes with links to all of the people, movies, and links discussed in this episode. This information is also attached to the show file in the podcast client of your choice. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play and Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review Remakers Mark, which would mean the world to us. And we're on YouTube now as well. We're on Facebook at Remakers Mark, Twitter at Remakers Mark, and Instagram at Remakers Mark Podcast. So please join in the discussion there as well. Well, that was really fun. I'm uh, I'm glad we went on this journey together, uh, and I cannot wait for the next journey as well. Man, this is a trip. Uh, until the next time, gentlemen, may the Force be with you. And also with you. Turns out Andy's, Andy's microphone hasn't been working this entire time. You guys haven't heard me? (laughs) I've been speaking for 40 minutes straight. (laughs) It was gold, I tell you, pure gold.